All right, welcome to lecture three in the Misu drought mini series. Uh, this time we're going to be focusing on leaky bucket models of soil moisture. Just to recap from the previous two lectures, a central idea to understanding drought is the concept of supply and demand. If the demand for moisture exceeds the supply for an extended period of time, you tend to have a drought. The details of the drought are, of course, specific to the system you're dealing with or the particulars of your research project. But in a very general sense, this idea of supply and demand is central to our thinking about drought. Last time in lecture two, we talked about indices and how drought indices can be used to try to approximate the relative positive and negative anomalies of the moisture balance. And so that if you get a anomaly in one part of the world, say Sweden, that's dry for an extended period of time, you can readily compare that anomaly to some other part of the world, say Brazil, uh, and the units mean the same thing because you're looking at drought indices. When we move now to look at leaky bucket models, we're really focused just on the quantity of soil moisture itself. And of course, because soils vary across space and climates vary across space, the value that we're talking about, the quantity that we're talking about, is going to have units of either kilograms per kilogram of soil or millimeters of moisture per, uh, per unit of soil. So we're no longer going to be able to as readily compare anomalies across space and through time as we are able to do with the drought indices that we discussed last time. But that caveat aside, let's dig in to this idea of a leaky bucket model. I've already alluded to it before. This concept of having uh, precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus runoff minus groundwater balance is a simple first order approximation to the moisture balance for a relatively large area, you know, a few hundred square meters uh, over a longer period of time, so weeks or months. And here are the equations, some of the basic equations that are used in this leaky bucket approach, which we've already talked about, uh, the first equation. So change in moisture content through time is going to be some function of the precipitation at that time, minus evapotranspiration, minus runoff, minus groundwater loss to the subsurface, unobservable ground groundwater loss. In this paper and in others, they further break apart the runoff component to separate out the surface runoff, so that's like stream flow moving across the surface, as well as subsurface flow. So that might be from one point to an adjacent point. Uh, that could be important in areas with low topography where there's a significant source of moisture from one grid point to the next grid point. So something like the Amazon basin might see that. It could also be important at higher spatial resolutions where the runoff from one grid cell to your adjacent grid cell matters. The two terms there, surface runoff and subsurface base flow, are further parameterized as a function first of just precipitation. So this S of t equals precipitation times soil moisture at time t, so soil moisture at a given month, uh, relative to the maximum water holding capacity of soil moisture at that site. And that's just a fixed number. That's just a parameter. So in a, in a really uh, porous soil, that W max would be higher. In really clay soil, it's not very porous, that W max would be lower. But this is just being parameterized in terms of only two other variables. One is the state of soil moisture right now, WT, and the other is the new influx of precipitation. And then this is just a coefficient that's a parameter that you estimate from the data. Then the base flow is sort of like a residual uh, with two additional parameters to Again, use only, and this is the key and the important part, if you look at the paper, the important part is to not require new sources of data to be able to parameterize these two quantities of runoff. Evapotranspiration in the original paper here, 1996, was parameterized as, or excuse me, a potential evapotranspiration, I should say, was parameterized solely as a function of temperature. And if you remember from last time, hopefully you will recognize that this is the Thornthwaite equation and generally should be avoided when possible because it's too simple and it overemphasizes the role that temperature plays in driving evapotranspiration. Another note, something to be aware of when you're looking at both drought indices as well as these leaky bucket models is that 
evapotranspiration at a given time is not the same thing as potential evapotranspiration. And so here in, in the papers that we're covering today, evapotranspiration, the actual estimate of the evapotransfer of flux from the surface of the soils to the atmosphere is parameterized as a function of potential evapotranspiration multiplied by, again, this quantity W, this should be WT, uh, over W max. So why does this difference matter? Just take a second to think about why does this matter? When might it be important? Well, in a desert region, you might have potential evapotranspiration that's very high in a month when no rainfall occurs, in which case the potential evapotranspiration is going to greatly exceed the actual evapotranspiration. So in arid regions, semi-arid regions, this, is, this, this difference is going to matter. And you look at the literature on drought indices like PDSI, you will find both can be used. Uh, there are examples where evapotranspiration is used or potential evapotranspiration is used. And again, just be aware of that when you look at those papers, which quantity is being used, and be aware that they're not the same thing, and potential evapotranspiration can be much higher than actual evapotranspiration, especially when it's hotter and drier. Operationally, the way that you would run one of these models, you can, this leaky bucket approach is simple enough that if you're comfortable in Python or R or MATLAB, you could easily code one up uh, in a day or two uh, just on your desktop your laptop. And so if you're going to do this, you typically initialize soil moisture with some mean value. And then you have to spin it up. And by spin up, I mean, you, you, you've got a bunch of different options for how you spin it up. You have to spin it up because you want your initial conditions before you actually start computing the model to represent uh, a plausible initial state for soil moisture. Because if you just started at zero, let's say in the extreme, you, you start with zero soil moisture. Well, last time we talked about autocorrelation and there's built-in autocorrelation to the soil moisture models like this one. It arises, it emerges from the dynamics of the system itself. And so if you started from zero, the first few months that you're using data to force your soil moisture model would cause a increase in soil moisture that was just reflecting the effects of those initial conditions sort of burning in or weaving their way into the soil moisture state. And you want to avoid that. And so a couple different options, two really easy different options is you, you set aside, say, I don't know, a year, two years, five years, 10 years of data that you use only to initialize the model before running it with the rest of your data. Another one is to just cycle through one year again and again and again. And so you create like a dummy data set of 10 years, which is really just a copy of the first year. Use that to initialize your model and then start with your, um, your period of data that you want to have, you know, that you want to actually use for your analysis. Compute the runoff, groundwater loss, compute potential evapotranspiration, compute actual evapotranspiration, and then update your soil moisture uh, state variable, WT, and then move on to the next time step, move on to the next month, and do it again. Uh, just a final little detail here on implementing this operationally for something like Python or MATLAB or R. We would, one very easy approach you could take is just applying Eulerian integration here. So if we look here at the, uh, the original equation up at the top, for the soil moisture change through time. And we undo the beauty of calculus and make it a discrete problem. So that W of T plus one minus WT over some delta T, some change in time, is a function of precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus runoff minus groundwater. Then we can just rearrange the terms to get a predictive model of soil moisture at time T plus one, that's on the left, as a function of our delta T multiplied through by all those other terms in there. That's how you would do this. All right, and here's some results from that uh, the assigned reading for this week, uh, Fan and Bandon Duel, 2004. They have done this, they've applied this leaky bucket model all over the world, all over the globe, obviously, except for Antarctica. Uh, at a quarter degree, or excuse me, half degree resolution, which lets them compute make, uh, compute climatologies. You can estimate the mean for each month in the data set over time with long temporal coverage. They're able to go from 1948, I think, through basically through present. Um, and because you can compute climatologies, you can compute anomalies. And so here is the soil moisture anomaly for July of 2003 in units of millimeters. So it's actual units of data Soil moisture anomaly is being shown for this July 2003 
Um, some of you may remember that July was a hot and dry month in Western Europe, actually led to severe heat waves uh, later in the season in August 2003. And you can see some of that aridity already present in the anomaly maps here uh, for Western Europe, parts of France and Sweden as well. All right, here's another example of the application of this data set, this data product. They're looking at the difference between March and September climatology. And that just really emphasizes the role of the ITPCC, the migration of the ITPCC and the monsoon regions in the tropics. Because uh, March, for example, if you just take March as the reference point um, in say, pick, pick an area, the Amazon, um, it's going to be much wetter in March in boreal spring than in boreal fall. And that's what this is showing in this difference map here annual migration the ITCC shows up in their estimates of soil moisture and that's just further evidence that this is a successful useful way to to try to monitor drought or at least to try to monitor soil moisture in the same way that we try to monitor and measure temperature precipitation surface pressure wind other gridded fields that we care about for the climate system uh, if you're looking at sweden or western europe north america you can say as you would expect the end of the growing, the end of the winter season is March, so spring. Soils tend to be pretty saturated, pretty wet when spring unfolds. You know, it's muddy as compared to September, which is drier. And you see that in those green regions as well. All right. Another application that they point to in this paper is just the, uh, the ability to make those climatologies and to look at the behavior of soil moisture on average at different locations through time. And here they do an entire hemispheric average of the different terms in their moisture balance. And this is just a cross check to say, yeah, I mean, this all, this all works out more or less the way you would expect it to and hope it to. All right, and that's it. That's all I got. Uh, this is a short one. If you want to dig into more details about the implementation and the results of this approach, here are two key papers, and you can look at ones that have been written since then. Um, this methodology is still used operationally. You can still find the data online, and it's it's not perfect. It is an oversimplification to the way that moisture balance works at uh, you know at hundred meter you know, kilometer scales. But uh, it's also it's not that bad. And the advantage of it over the more sophisticated land surface models that we're going to talk about next time is that it doesn't require that much more data. You really just have to have data to be able to uh, account for the precipitation influx to parameterize evapotranspiration. And then you need surface properties of soil and slope aspects that you can account for the runoff parameters. So overall, it's, uh, it's sort of a compromise between the more simplified indices that we've talked about before and the more sophisticated, fully coupled, or at least partially coupled land surface models that are, are trying to simulate and are simulating a, a large number of processes. Thank you very much. So long.